reminder that uh, October the 23rd that we have another field trip with, uh, with the Harrisburg Roundtable. And we do have 15 seats left. And I recommend anybody wants to come because we have Chris Mikowski who did the uh, wilderness for us. And it was just, it was a fantastic time. And like I said, we had a, a great time um, with, with Dennis at, at, at Antietam. And those who that were on the trip with us, if you would, if you have pictures that you'd like to share, either send them to me or, or to Jim or to the Facebook and he'll put, he'll put them on our, on our website for everybody to take a look at it. And just a reminder with us also, it's coming up uh, for 20, wow, 2022 dues. And again, uh, I could send you an application or again, if you go online, you could um, on our face, on, excuse me, on our website, you could sign up for the uh, 2022 uh, year. Like a lot of places we do need the, the I mean, the, the membership to, just to keep us going. And so what I'd like to do is uh, all part of it, uh, John, uh, Happily retired uh, park ranger from Gettysburg, uh, John. Uh, we got. I'll unmute. I'll mute myself. And why don't you go ahead and you've got the controls to share the screen, and and we're ready for you. Okay. Thank you, Ricky. And good evening, everybody. I'm sorry we couldn't do this do this in person, in person. Um, but the way it is because of COVID nineteen and everything else going on, I understand that. But uh, tonight's program is uh, about some pretty graphic photographs that were taken on the battlefield of Gettysburg. And we're very well aware of these photographs being taken on the battlefield, but the debate has always been, where were they taken? What I wanna do is go back a little bit, talk about the genesis of these photographs, how they came about into the public domain, how more and more people have been researching them in the past couple of years and trying to find the location. Uh, a lot of the experience I had with the National Park Service here at Gettysburg was going through these images and the research in the background of trying to locate them and find out really where they are. And a lot of it's based on the research by John Cummings, who has a wonderful blog, the Spotsylvania Civil War blog, as well as Scott Hardwig, my former uh, supervisory historian at Gettysburg, who also did a heck of a lot of research in putting this program together. And uh, I helped him as well as worked with John and a few others. Um, and to me, the, the, I think we've we found it. But I wanna give everybody a little bit of warning. Uh, first, this is a very long detailed program. If you have questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them at the end. But also there are some very um, graphic scenes that not or for the, or not for the meek of heart. Uh, so if there are upsetting to you, I'm very apologized for that, but uh, this is this is war, and this is what war is all about, and this is what we're going to talk about tonight. Find the harvest of death. These gruesome images were taken on the battlefield of Gettysburg sometime in July 1863 by Alexander Gardner, a photographer from Washington, D.C., Gardner's photographs of the battlefield are probably very well known to anybody who has done any research or reading about the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, without a doubt, Gardner's photographs of the dead taken on the Rose Farm and the slaughter pen uh, at the Sharpshooter's Nest in Devil's Den and elsewhere on the battlefield are probably some of the most widely discussed, uh, republished over and over and over again and talked about images in the field. What is provocative about this particular one the Harvest of Death is that it is one of the first ones published during the war that I'm aware of. Nashville shows federal dead on the battlefield lying where they fell. And that's what we're gonna talk about tonight is the search for the location of where these images were taken. The Genesis goes back to 1866. Uh, Gardner's photographic sketchbook of the war, volume one is his photographic sojourn throughout the Civil War, it starts in 1861 all the way to 1865. Gardner's images primarily have been shown in his gallery in Washington, DC and New York City. And not a lot of wide distribution of these images, but for this photographic sketchbook, he chooses two which are of particular interest, plates 36 and plate 37, 36 being a harvest of death and 37 field where General Reynolds fell 
battlefield of Gettysburg. This is plate 36 in your, on the left here, Harvest of Death, probably uh, very recognizable to a lot of folks who've seen it. it. Shows a long scattered battle line of Union bodies laying all over the field, but there's nothing particularly interesting about this other than the bodies. And as we look at these images to the left and the field where Reynolds fell to the right, let's remember that Gardner's primary interest in these photographs was not documenting the background, not documenting the landscape, was photographing those bodies there. That's his primary objective in doing these images. It wasn't until 1975 when um, Bill Frasnito published his book, Gaysburg, A Journey in Time, is the first work to really seriously look at all of these period photographs taken by Gardner, Brady, and many others, and try to find the original locations where these photographs were taken in July 1863. Uh, Bill's provocative work, um, I think, set the standard for a study of this, not just this battlefield, but many other battlefields, Antietam, the wilderness, Spotsylvania, and especially Petersburg. Uh, Bill is a very thorough historian, very thorough uh, writer, uh, very descriptive. But one thing Bill did in this early day was he cast a lot of doubt on Gardner's description of the scenes in that particular sketchbook, and as well as some of his entries in his 1863 catalog of wartime photographs. Gardner made a lot of mistakes. And we have to look back at who Alexander Gardner really was, because in many ways, that is the source of our quest here. Who was Alexander Gardner? What was his objective in coming to Gettysburg and photographing there on the field? Gardner was Scottish born. He came to the United States, I believe in 1856, where he did several different work jobs, did things, but then he finally latched on to Matthew Brady and his photographic company became a photographer for Matthew Brady. Uh, Gardner is very well known, I think, by many of us today, but in the 1860s, no one had ever heard of Alexander Gardner. He was the photographer, uh, but all the photographs that were published were published under Matthew Brady. It wasn't until after his series at Antietam that Gardner then decided to go out on his own, open his own gallery in Washington, and hire his own photographers, Timothy O'Sullivan and James Gibson. And it's this little team that Gardner is gonna to bring to Gettysburg in the summer of 1863. When we look at this whole quest to find where these photographs were taken, and we look at Gardner, there's five questions I wanna throw out to you. You don't have to take notes on this, there'll be no test. But the first one is how and when did Gardner and his cameraman get to the battlefield? And what were the first sites he discovered once he got here? Number two, what was the location of General Reynolds' death? And was that a priority for Gardner to photograph it? Number three, where on the battlefield were federal dead bodies lying untouched and unburied as late as July 6th? Number four, did Gardner purposely mislead readers with his captions in these images in his sketchbook as Bill Frasnito thought he did? And number five, how do these photographs illustrate the events at this specific location? Now, one thing Bill did, um, he, in his journey in time, he identified these two separate places being basically the same group, just photographed from different angles. So we know that that's the same group of Federals laying in the same location. Nothing's been moved, nothing's been altered. But as far as Gardner's concerned, he's not concerned with photographing dead at this point. He has left Washington with his photographers as much supplies as he can carry. And remember folks, this is early photography. So everything goes onto a glass plate chemicals have to be carried with it. And it's very light sensitive, so we have to be very careful in mixing these chemicals, do it in the dark, photograph it, and then develop that material right away. He doesn't have a lot of, uh, of time to play around with these things, especially given the conditions that summer where it was quite warm and rather humid throughout the summer, especially in July of 1863. Now, Gardner left Washington, got to Frederick, and then it was sometime between Frederick and Emmitsburg, when he's following the trail of the army, that he hears John Reynolds is killed in action on the first day of the battlefield. The story goes that Reynolds' death is reported uh, as early as the evening of July 1st, and by the morning of July 2nd, it's in northern newspapers everywhere. John Reynolds is um, 
one of the highest ranking officers in the Army of the Potomac and was supposedly going to be given command of the Army, which he deferred and eventually George Gordon Meade and actually took command. By the time Gardner gets to Emmitsburg, Maryland, about 10 miles south of Gettysburg, the battle is just then winding down. He gets there around July 3rd or July 4th, I don't remember exactly which, but he stays here at the Farmer's Inn, just on the west, northwest side of Emmitsburg. And uh, he sets out on July 5th for the battlefield. Fortunately, that morning, he went to visit some, some friends or relatives and came back to the hotel just to find out that Stuart and his cavalry had just passed through there or picking up federal officials, postmasters, whatever. So to Gardner, that was, again, a big escape for him. He escaped the clutches of Jeb Stuart and his Confederate cavalry. In company with Charles Keener, who was a representative of the United States Sanitary Commission, also staying at the Farmer's Inn, they set out finally for the battlefield of Gettysburg at about three, maybe two, three, three that afternoon. And the only reason we know that uh, Keener uh, was accompanied uh, the army photographer was he didn't really have his name of Alexander Gardner. He just says in company of an army photographer. Well, there's no other photographers close by except uh, Alexander Gardner. So we analyzed Gardner's trip to Gettysburg. Let's look back at what Bill said in his books, especially beginning in Journey in Time. Um, he remarks that Gardner had to work swiftly for the early afternoon, July 5th. If Gardner gets to the battlefield that afternoon, he only has limited time to photograph sites on the field on the southern part of the battlefield. Bill surmised um, that Gardner came up the Emmitsburg Road that placed him immediately on the last portion of the battlefield to be cleared of his dead, which was the Rose Farm, Trussell Farm, Peach Orchard area. Um, that may be true, but we have to look at the, it, it this way too, in that the Emmitsburg Road was not a freeway. It was not a highway. By the time Gardner got close to Gettysburg or along Marsh Creek, lay the entire Fifth Corps. The Fifth Corps was stationed along Marsh Creek with pickets posted about a half mile south of there, stopping and turning back anybody who came up the Emmitsburg Road headed for Gettysburg. It was still an active military situation by the afternoon and evening of July 5th. The Army of Northern Virginia had just left that morning, the Army of Potomac in pursuit, and no one knows where the Confederates are, except for maybe Jeb Stewart, who has now gone through Emmitsburg and up in Smithburg and up in the hills, where he skirmished with uh, the Federal Cavalry. So there's an active situation. And though we all know Alexander Gardner today, those pickets didn't know Alexander Gardner from a hole in the wall. If he didn't have proper credentials, they did not let him through. Now, if we follow Keener's account, it suggests he reached the town of Gettysburg about 6 p.m. That would probably place them near the battlefield closer to 5, 5.30. Uh, if this interpretation correct, as Bill says, is presumably still accompanied by the Army photographer, which would be Alexander Gardner, and perhaps an hour or so before proceeding into town, they'd only have about an hour and a half of sun, sunlight, adequate sunlight, to photograph anything on the battlefield. So again, I cast doubt into the fact that, or to the, the idea that Gardner and his team had plenty of time to photograph all those scenes on the southern part of the battlefield, the famous scenes of dead Confederates at the Rose Farm, at Little Round Top, in the slaughter pen, and possibly the Trossel Farm. As Bill says, Gardner's team was in full operation by Ju July 6th, which I have no doubt of that, the last date upon which the camera would have been able to secure views portraying Union burial details and turning Union dead. So let's look at the maps. Let's look at the map of Adams County. How did Gardner get here? He could have come right from Emmitsburg, straight up the Emmitsburg Road as Bill surmises, to the Peach Orchard area, we'd have plenty of views of the Rose Farm, uh, battle damage, the scars of battle, all in the southern part of the field. Again, we have to look at what was right here at Greenmount Post Office was the entire Fifth Corps with pickets just about south of there turning everybody back. Gardner had an alternate route, though, the same route that Humphrey's division of the uh, Second Division of the Third Corps had used on July 1st, as well as Biddle's brigade, uh, the 1st Army Corps had used to get to Gettysburg, which is an alternate route off the Emmitsburg Road and up by uh, crossing Florida Marsh Creek, Red Rock Road, and eventually turning here into right into uh, the battlefield itself. 
What leads me to this conclusion is this particular photograph, which was discovered a couple of years ago in the Library of Congress, is the G.J. White House, which stands just stood just above the Ford uh, Red Rock Road on Marsh Creek. In 1863, when Gardner came to photograph the National Cemetery dedication, he took pains, great pains, to go all the way south, about three and a half miles south, to photograph this particular house. And why was that? Uh, I surmise, and I, I think I'm pretty correct on this, in that Gardner stopped at that house. Later on, when his son wrote an article that he had led an army photographer to Gettysburg, I have no doubt that Gardner photographed this house, was going to use it as part of his story of his adventures of how they got to Gettysburg, just like he photographed the hotel in, in the Farmer's Inn in Emmitsburg. And this is where he stopped to get the guide to Gettysburg. If this is the case, he did not come up the Emmitsburg Road indeed, but he did come up Red Rock Road by today Eisenhower's National Historic Site, took a right on the Millerstown Road, which would have left him right to the Peach Orchard, the Emmitsburg Road north to Gettysburg, which was not heavily picketed at the time. There was only baggage, artillery, and the flotsam and jetsam really of the army as now it's moving out following Lee's retreat. So let's look at it this way. If Gardner's team arrived at Emsburg Road on July 5th, late in the afternoon, about the same time Keener got there, and he sees by these scenes on the Rose Farm, everywhere else, would he have spent that afternoon photographing all those sites? Did he have enough time? I really don't think so. Again, there was barely an hour and a half of sunlight left that he could adequately shoot scenes on that part of the field. He's gonna wait till the following day, July 6th to do that, which I almost laughingly refer to, that's photograph day for Gardner and his team. I believe that they arrived on the Millerstown Road and the first horrific scene they saw was actually the Trossel Farm and the dead of the batter, of dead horses of the uh, Ninth Massachusetts batteries. They still lay some of them strapped in their harnesses. But let's go back to this too. Gardner is really concerned in photographing the site where Reynolds fell. There is no one, no one who can tell him where that particular site is. The history of the Battle of Gettysburg is so fresh and Gardner is not a military historian. He only can ask people and a lot of people, officers wounded or those on picket, they don't know. Everybody sees a singular thing but for, for Gardner to try to find out where the site was, he can't dally very long here on the southern part of the field. He has to go into town and try to find, ask questions, try to find somebody to guide him out there. So that is really his objective. And again, it comes back to was location of General Reynolds' death a priority for Gardner to photograph? I believe so. Uh, Major General Reynolds was the commander of the First Corps, killing in action early in the action on July 1st. Uh, he was one of the most famous officers in the Army of the Potomac, without a doubt, for an officer of his rank, rank high rank, and uh, integrity and likability, corps commander. His death in the battlefield was of high significance to Gardner. And during of Reynolds' death on or about July 2nd, I believe that was a priority for him to at least find the location, general site where Reynolds fell and photograph that site. That was his primary objective in coming to Gettysburg. So where, when he gets here, are bodies untouched and buried as late as July 6th? Let's look at it this way. Um, I think, and I'm not here to disparage anybody in their search for the scenes of the harvest of death or the field where Reynolds fell, any of that stuff. What I'm here to say is that there are indications in the textual record, that is the official records of the Army of the Potomac and Army of Northern Virginia, the War of the Rebellion records, Volume 27, parts one, two, and three, that adequately supplies information about when dead were buried on that battlefield, especially on the second and the third day of the action. As Bill surmises in early photography at Gettysburg, Union dead would have been available on the southern portion of the battlefield through July 6th, particularly in the areas that were within Confederate lines during the last two days of fighting. Um, that's a really good question, a good point to throw out there, but again, Let's look at the record and what the official records say. If in the reports, they say they went out and buried their comrades on July 3rd and on July 4th, 
And early on the morning, July 5th, there are going to be no federal dead laying on any portion of that battlefield. If there were, there would have been a lot more photographs taken of federal dead beside these two, these two groups, the Harvest of Death and the uh, field where Reynolds fell. Uh, there is evidence in the official records, and I have to point to the 1st Minnesota Infantry. On the night of July 2nd, after that deadly charge into the Plum Run area, and so many men were lost, they went out there in the darkness, despite the danger of pickets, nervous pickets, brought their own dead and buried them back on the Hummelbaugh farm. They didn't bury them right there in the site. They brought their own dead back, grouped them together, and buried them on the Hummelbar farm. Uh, the 1st Minnesota was the only group to do that. But the Union had control of the entire battlefield except for Seminary Ridge uh, early on July 4th. And it was during that day after some of the skirmish and shooting in the morning that burial details went out and began to bury their dead. Any combat soldier who has served beside a buddy and lost a buddy out in that field is going to go out and find him and try and give him a decent burial, at least find his body, get his records, get his letters, whatever, send them home. He's going to look after his friend. That's one thing that has never changed through time. And I believe that to be the case there on July 4th. I call July 4th burying day. As uh, General Hayes, who's the commander of the Second Corps, after Hancock was one of the reports, that on the morning of July 5th, they buried well over 300 Confederates on the Second Corps front, the result of Pickett's charge and the fight before that. So if they're going to go out and bury the Confederate dead on the morning of July 4th, are they going to leave their comrades laying exposed in these areas at the Peach Orchard, Rose Farm, Wheat Field. No, they're not. Not just textual record, but there's also a photographic record of this. Again, these are Gardner photographs taken in the slaughter pen, the Valley of Death, and of Little Round Top. And this graphic scene in the upper left here, you've probably seen before two Confederates lying behind uh, these large boulders. Both were killed probably in the fighting on July 2nd. The reason they were not buried or carried out by their comrades because during July 3rd, there was so much sharpshooting going on, no one could retrieve the bodies of their friends. Where just behind Devil's Den, I know for a fact that Benning's brigade spent the evening of July 2nd, part of July 3rd, carrying their dead off the hillside and burying them down to the slider farm. <coughs> While the Confederates are exposed here along Plum Run, no more than 45 feet to the north in this panoramic view that Gardner takes of Little Round Top, you can see freshly buried, gra uh, fresh grave right here, probably the dead, Union dead that were buried there either that morning or um, uh, a day or two before by federal pickets that went out, federal details went out and buried the dead. This graphic scene of the Trussell Farm is another one I'd like to point out. I use this quite a bit. Uh, if Gardner arrived, at the Peach Orchard, but via the Millerstown Road, started up the Emmitsburg Road, which was at that time clogged with baggage from the Fifth Corps wagons and things like that. This may have been one of the first scenes he saw and possibly photographed on July 5th. He would have had enough time that evening to photograph this scene. And as the graphic scene, the results of the 9th Massachusetts Battery being overrun and captured by the 21st Mississippi. <coughs> Just the north of the Trussell buildings, was this graphic scene, which Gardner titled All Over Now. It's a stereo view by Gibson. Um, Gibson had the stereo view camera, which was two lenses. It's probably a um, <clears throat> destroyed limber uh, battery K 4th US artillery. But what's interesting about this, and Bobby Hoosh, who used to run the Gettysburg Daily website, did a really good job on taking a high resolution in, uh, copy of this and discussing not just what you see in the foreground, but what's in the background. The background shows wagons of the Fifth Corps. You see up here with looks like an artillery forge and some other things backed up. The traffic's backed up going down the Emmitsburg Road. Beyond that is the Klingel Farm Building. What's more interesting to me is this mound of earth right here and this line of earth right here which are graves, probably federal graves. Federal details went out on July 4th, buried their comrades there in the field. No identities, there's no markers to them. So we go back to this. I don't believe there are any federal dead to be photographed on the battlefield of July 2nd. 
on the battlefield of July 3rd. Those dead had already been buried by the time Gardner got there late on the afternoon of July 5th. Did he intentionally mislead readers with the captions for these images in his sketchbook? Um, Bill threw this around quite a bit. And in Journey in Time, he really believed that Gardner made up a lot of these things just to fill out the story. And in one instance where the bodies are identified in his 1863 catalog as Confederates, it's a mistake he made like any human can do. We all make mistakes. Uh, you, know, you, you put something in the wrong drawer or whatever. Gardner made a, a lot of mistakes, not just in that catalog, but several others and several other identities throughout the war of trying to locate photographs and where they were taken. <coughs> As Bill says, this contradiction may have been a lapse of memory on Gardner's part, but then he says explicitly, more likely it was deliberate. Uh, why would it be deliberate? Why would it be deliberate? In this statement, Bill sets the groundwork for everyone to doubt Gardner's sincerity and his honor and basically his an intent in trying to put descriptions with these images. Um, we went through this over and over and over again. Scott Hartwig, we started looking at this in 2002, talked about this quite a bit. Why would Gardner lie about this? Why would he make these stories up just to make himself look good? And that soon after the war, when he doesn't really know all the battle history like we know today, um, he's going to try to do his best to identify where these scenes were taken based off the records he took at that time. And unfortunately, if he did keep a journal apart from his um, photographic catalog, it has never surfaced. Uh, we just really don't know if, if he wrote this stuff down, specifically where he was in the field, how he took it, the time he took it, we just don't know. So a lot of that really is up to speculation. And then Bill re, uh, recited that again later on in his book, Early Photography at Gettysburg, that the fact remains no identifiable scenes from Gardner's 63 series were produced from a camera position on the first day's field, either west or north of town. So Bill's sticking by that, but my question has always been, and this is, uh, I, I, it's not just me, but it was really Scott that generated this about 2002, 2003. Why would Gardner lie about this? Why would he make these stories up? And what if he did get to the first day's battlefield? Where are sites on the battlefield that federal dead are still going to be exposed, unburied, and uncared for? Uh, the earliest Gardner could probably get out there if he arrives late on July 5th would be July 6th. There's still burial parties working on the first day's battlefield as late as the afternoon of July 6th. Again, let's go back to look at this. Gardner's viewpoint and the objective is to photograph the site where Reynolds fell. He gets to town, stays town that night in Gettysburg. Early the next morning, he sets out in the general location where he thinks or he knows or somebody has told him, we just don't know, the area where Reynolds fell very early in the battle. So the site we're talking about is out here on the McPherson farm and adjacent to it is the John Herbst farm just to the south. The woods here, we sometimes people refer to as McPherson's woods. Uh, it's actually uh, the Herbst farm woods, Herbst woods and the fields around it. Um, the battle action that morning primarily involves a very quick reaction with the Iron Brigade against Archer's Brigade. Then the fighting really consumes both brigades, everybody that afternoon. Pettigrew takes on the Iron Brigade there in the woods, is slowly driven back. Stone's Brigade out in McPherson Farm along the Chambersburg Pike is also driven back. The only regiments backing them up and can cover any sort of withdrawal are those three under Biddle. The 121st Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry, the 20th New York State Militia, also called the 80th New York, and the 142nd Pennsylvania Infantry. During this action that afternoon, which starts primarily around 2, 3, 3 o'clock as the federal line is collapsing back off of McPherson Farm and off the Herps Farm towards the seminary, which would be to your right, uh, the, the two regiments you see there at the bottom, the 8th and the 121st, are going to shift north just behind Herbst Woods to cover part of the withdrawal of the Iron Brigade as they're coming out of Herbst Woods. We compare that view with what we have here, the Elliott map as of the battlefield produced in 1864. This map famously tries to mark where all the burial sites are on the field. Um, the Confederate graves are distinguished from the Union graves. 
And here in the McPherson farm, just at the point of the Herps Woods, is a small flag where Reynolds fell, a line of graves here, line of graves over here and here and here. Uh, remember this, especially these back here, because I'm going to talk about this in a little bit. Um, where they found, what the burial details found out on July 1st battlefield was um, that the Confederates primarily had all been buried, primarily buried on July 2nd, a few on July 3rd, where a lot of the Union dead were still lying, exposed, unburied, uncared for, where they had fallen or where they had died in the woods. Only in one case was uh, uh, the chaplain of the 24th Michigan able to make his way through the lines on July 2nd and go out and try and bury all the dead he could find from his own regiment. But it, what, uh, what, what comes back to us too is that the uh, sites out there were absolutely horrible. There was very little time for Gardner to take in what he saw. And if he got out to that field, the field where Reynolds fell, the first group he sees is this one right here. This gathering of federal bodies, this concentration is on these bodies laying here. Some of the first images of federal dead photographed on any battlefield in the American Civil War. And he has the interest in them. He's got the, the capture of them. Now look very closely, not so much at the bodies right now, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but look at the background. We have a fence line that runs actually east to west. This is the border of the McPherson farm and Herbst farm, borders right to uh, the corner of Herbst Woods. It winds up over here to the right at the seminary. And in the center, you'll see these two trees. Those two trees uh, play a large role later on in identifying this location. This is the uncropped image that was photographed by Gardner, the cropped image that showed up in the sketchbook. Um, Touch out a lot of these details, but this uncropped image throws more detail into it, including additional bodies in the background, this ridge line, the trees, these two trees here, and structures up here on the right-hand side. Uh, in 2008, 2009, Scott was doing further research on this and found uh, further accounts of, eyewitness accounts of the federal dead lying on the field. And one came from, I have to read it to you. The man's name was Edwin Gearhart. He was a soldier in the 142nd Pennsylvania. Gearhart was wounded on July 1st and captured near the seminary. His captor led him to the Confederate rear with some other prisoners. And as they're going over the battlefield on July 2nd, he says, I was surprised to see so few dead and wounded rebels as I passed back over the ground, but there's plenty of ours scattered all around. We passed over the ridge where our men first stood in line it could easily be traced by the blue line of fallen men of whom were lying right on their backs or upon their bellies. In fact, they lay in all sorts of positions. That is a pretty horrible description. And this scene here fairly well matches that. Now, about the time that Scott was doing his research on this and we were, I was kind of assisting him, a man named John Cummings, who has his Spotsylvania blog, was also interested in photographing this site on the first day's field. Uh, John's research in comparing the photographs, especially the uncut images directly from the Library of Congress, focus on the backgrounds I just pointed out to you, the trees, the fence line, the ridge line, as well as this little cluster of buildings up here. It is, these are buildings in the background, light reflecting on them uh, because the roof line and everything else, they're really hard structures. You can tell they're hard structures. The problem has always been getting a clear, uh, clear copy of this particular image. But Scott, when I photographed this in 2010, which he put on the park blog with part of his discussion about, is this the location of the harvest of death? And as you see, the ground has changed quite a bit. The tree is gone, the fence line is gone. You can barely see the Chambersburg Road here. The ridge line has changed dramatically because of the tree growth and then the old hotel that was there, which is no longer standing, was removed several years later by Lee's headquarters. In the meantime, John was working on his own research project and had chosen about the same site. Um, his photograph here too, which shows up on his Spotsylvania blog, generally the same location, uh, shows the Chambersburg Pike, Seminary Ridge in the background, the tree line, Lee's headquarters, 
and the field here where possibly those bodies were gathered. Uh, the tree line itself has changed dramatically. This lot originally was owned by McPherson. It was the McPherson Woods. And in front of that lot was a large oat field. Uh, and it, my understanding is, I'm not a farmer, but my understanding is oats often turn right about to the first, last of June, first of July, and give off this golden color. Well, it's, it matches that oat field that McPherson had planted out there, which is kind of interesting. In the foreground, this would have been wheat and meadow. Well, what the detail of that photo shows too, and John pointed this out on his Spotsylvania blog, is that possibly is the Thompson house. It's distinguishable by the roof line, the chimney, and the trees around it, as well as the white fence. You can barely see the white fence. The focus, again, of the photograph itself is the group of dead, not the background. And anybody who has studied these Civil War era images and these glass plates can realize the focus can be so crystal clear, you can see the outline of an eagle on the button but the background is always going to be a little hazy. It's just, it's a, it's a problem with the lenses. The lenses were that uh, uh, elaborate, for lack of a better term, back in the 1860s. But that could possibly be the Thompson house. And to be honest, looking at it very closely from that angle, especially after the restoration done by the Civil War, Tr the, uh, Civil War Trust, the Battlefield Trust, which did an outstanding job there, the site looks more like what it did look in 1863 with where that structure should be, the Widow Thompson House, which was Lee's headquarters. This is the photograph here by Brady, uh, July 14th, 15th, taken by Brady because they found out that was Lee's headquarters. This is the second of that series of images of this particular group, the final photo, where burial detail has now shown up and are waiting for Gardner to finish his image and uh, or finish his photograph so they can continue the burial process. Uh, they've already completed two burials in the background over here to the left. And again, this defense line, Seminary Ridge into Oak Ridge with McPherson Woods, the Oat Field, the Chambersburg Pike runs right about where this tree stands. The two trees over here, one partially blocked by this soldier. But what is interesting about this too, and this goes right along with Gearhart's account, John pointed this out in his blog. In high resolution image, copy this photograph, you can look beyond the background, beyond the destroyed fence, and you see a line of posts and disturbed earth here. That matches the general location shown on the Elliott map of where Confederate burials took place on July 2nd, most likely the dead of Scales North Carolina Brigade, which were uh, unfortunately slaughtered here in this field Late in the afternoon of July 1st, the casualties were so heavy amongst the regiments, one or two regiments lost over 100 men um, uh, out of 120. That's how bad they took it on the chin out there. There was nowhere to put them. Put them. Uh, the soldiers took down what little fence they could, just at least mark the graves as best they could. And that line of burials tells me right there that the Confederates controlled this site for at least 24 to 48 hours to get their dead buried but then no more than 100 feet away lie the unburied bodies of federal dead, which obviously they did not have any concern for. Again, we go back to the objective of what Gardner was trying to photograph on July 1st. It was so important where Reynolds fell that Matthew Brady did the same two weeks later when he came to Gettysburg and visited in mid-July. He photographed the general area of the woodlot where Reynolds fell on July uh, 1st, and this is Brady with a, a guide or an assistant out here in the field pointing towards the general location. Again, it's so soon after the battle, they really don't know specific spot where Reynolds fell, which will be marked later on with a monument and a marker. Detail in this image is pretty interesting though. <coughs> here in the meadow, the high grass, you see McPherson's cornfield, which goes out right to the peak of McPherson's Ridge. In the background is the Thompson house. And or not the Thompson House, excuse me, it's the house um, on the seminary. I can't remember the name of it. Seminary uh, steeple is sticking up there, the observatory. And right here, this dark blob, which you see below the detail, are the two trees that are in that image I was just talking about early before. This, in some ways, helps verify those two trees 
photograph in that scene, the field where Reynolds fell, had been photographed again by Brady two weeks later. This is the image that Scott put up uh, in his discussion on the Gettysburg blog about where he thought the images were taken in the general direction. Again, this was a very general area. He used this photograph, a panorama taken from the Lutheran Theological Seminary Observatory about 1878 or 1879, looking directly almost to the west southwest. It shows the line where Biddle's men would have been in the afternoon fighting on July 1st before they shifted the north to cover the withdrawal of Stone as well as Meredith. Uh, by that time, the Cadillacian Springs Hotel has been established on the Harmon Farm. And what you see here is the horse-drawn railway that ran out to the Herps Woods. Turning that camera to the right, again, here's the field directly, the view directly west. This is Herps Woods, McPherson Farm. And here are the two trees, again, they were in the background of that particular image, the field where Reynolds fell. And actually they've grown quite a bit in 15 to 20 years, much larger, but if you look real close in a high resolution image, those trees are two trees and they're still there. So turning the camera then to the south, there are details in this image that are not real uh, easy to point out in a very, because it's so blurry, especially in the background. But there are details in the background you can not pick out if the camera position is located right. As, as Scott pointed out in his blog, uh, the details of the scene match the description of the action between the 20th. Oh my God, you're like dying. Oh my God. 21st Pennsylvania. Um, looking to the south, you see seminary. Is this allowed? In the distance. Is somebody asking something? Is this allowed? Hello. You need to mute Hello? your mic. Sorry, I was talking to my buddy over here. I didn't know I was unmuted. Yeah, unmute, please. Mute, mute up, please. Right. There you okay. go. Um, the Hagerstown Rose in the background. To the right is the wooded ridge above the Manuel Pitzer Farm, which was AP Hill's headquarters. There are dark images in the background beyond these soldiers standing here. And I know they've been interpreted as buildings. Uh, no, they are not. They are trees. You can tell by the shape of them that they are not structures of any sort. But our trees. And this no, is the, of the harvest of death. Again, the view taken by John Cummings. Hello. It's not really coming up on my screen, okay? So I'm going to just kind of stumble through it here. And once again, we're going to try and uh, pick up where we left off two weeks ago. Uh, finding the harvest of death. Again, I want to reiterate that a lot of this information is from not just me, but other sources. Scott Hartwig, who's a supervisory uh, historian there at Gaysburg National Military Park, was my boss for many, many years, as well as John Cummings, who has a wonderful blog, the Spotsylvania Civil War blog. And I'll give you the link to that at the very end. Uh, there are other researchers. I really have to point out one man named Scott Fink, who I've worked with quite a bit about uh, information on the Rose Farm. And he's working on a really detailed history of the Rose Farm, which I'm looking forward to sometime in the next year or two. And there's one or two others that have also helped out. But a lot of what I'm presenting tonight is a combination of material that I worked with Scott, as well as with John and several others on, to determine the best evidence of where these images were taken, the harvest of death. Now, the review, um, again, it goes right back to Gardner's photographic sketchbook published in 1866 when those first images were shown to the public and have been a challenge to researchers, buffs, historians ever since as to where they were taken on the battlefield of Gettysburg. Uh, those images are plate 36, a harvest of death, and plate 37 marked by Gardner, the photographer, the field where Reynolds fell. Again, Bill Frasinuto and his groundbreaking work, A Journey in Time, set the standard as far as battlefield study for photography here at Gettysburg and many other battlefields. But it's here at Gettysburg, he's the first one to take these historic images taken by Alexander Gardner, as well as Matthew Brady and many others, and go back to the sites of where they were and not just locate the original site of where those photographs were taken, but also interpret them. And Bill sets, unfortunately in a way, sets kind of a bad standard here in that he doubts everything that Gardner writes about in some of the catalog and some of his descriptions, especially in relation to these two photographs 
taken here in Gettysburg of Union dead. Uh, Alexander Gardner is primarily the culprit. And this Gardner that we have to try to understand who, what was his motive in coming here to Gettysburg? Bill seems to reiterate that his main motive was to photograph dead on the battlefield. That may have been some of it, but there are other motives as well. And that's what we have to talk about tonight. And that's what we have to look at and focus on in that what was Gardner's main focus? What was his main objective in coming to Gettysburg? Was it just to view battlefield dead and carnage? Were there other sites here that were just as important to him? And we have to go back to his earlier photography at the Battle of Antietam, where he photographed certain scenes there of carnage that were just devastating to, especially to the public in 1862, 1863, but more devastating, I think, to us today as we go back to study those battlefields and study where those dead fell and where they were photographed. Gardner's motive in coming here, I think, is much more complicated than people think. And again, I ask these five questions. How and when did Gardner and his cameraman get to the battlefield and what were the first sites he discovered when he got here? What was the location of General Reynolds' death? Was that a priority for Gardner? The photograph. Uh, where on the battlefield were federal bodies still lying untouched and buried as late as July 6th, July 7th? Because Gardner did not get here until late on July 5th. Did Gardner purposely mislead right readers with his captions of these images and his sketchbook as Fraz Nito thought? And number five, how do these photographs illustrate events at this specific location? Gardner was not just a photographer, he was also a showman. So in some ways he liked to photograph things that he had visited, places he had been. And that's why he photographed this particular building there in Emmitsburg, Maryland, the Farmer's Inn, where he was nearly captured by Jeb Stewart's cavalryman, supposedly, on the morning of July 5th. It delayed his journey to Gettysburg, but by the time he got going late that afternoon, he was accompanied, uh, accompanied rather, by Charles Keener, a representative of the U.S. Sanitary Commission. And Keener kept a pretty good diary. Uh, he remarked in his diary that they did not arrive in the battlefield until about 4.30 or 5 o'clock that afternoon. That would give Gardner a limited amount of time, especially with light, proper light, to actually expose photographs on the battlefield. They photographed the farmers in on his return to Washington on or about July 9th, I don't think later than the 10th, and then was going to use this to tell his story, his personal story of the sojourn to Gettysburg. So he analyzed Gardner's trip to Gettysburg from the beginning at the farmers in Emmitsburg on July 5th to Gettysburg and how he got here. Uh, again, I go back to what Bill and his groundbreaking work has done, but he also sets the route that a lot of photographers and, or, or buffs rather and historians of others have used say this is how Gardner got to the battlefield this is what he did this is where he found things okay we can answer that question in many ways we have to look at the maps and understand the military maneuvers on July 5th when Gardner is now trying to make his way to Gettysburg Gettysburg is about eight and a half miles north of Emmitsburg Maryland across the Maryland border the problem is Gardner has got to run to a lot of Union troops up here. Remember, Jeb Stewart's cavalry has just gone through Emmitsburg that morning. It's still an active combat situation here in the county. So there are Union troops now in search of not just Jeb Stewart, but also Lee's retreating army, which has left the Gettysburg battlefield towards Hagerstown, Maryland. So there's still a very active situation here. And like I said before, I don't think people in the army, everyone knew Alexander Gardner like we know them today. He could have had a small card, I'm the army photographer. That really doesn't mean anything when you come up to a picket post and you say, we can't let you pass because we do know through documentation that civilians trying to get back to the battlefield on July 4th, July 5th to get back to their homes were turned away by picket posts on the Emmitsburg Road, the Baltimore Pike and some of the other roads coming into Gettysburg. Gardner would be no different. So Gardner probably took a different route uh, Scott Harvick and I discussed this years and years ago of how Gardner would have gotten to the battlefield, discover these sites. Could he have come up on an alternate route? And one road that was used very heavily by Union troops and later Confederate troops during the battle action was Pumping Station Road today, Red Rock Road, it's called Millerstown Road, and Red Rock Road, which runs right by Willoughby Run to Marsh Creek. Uh, those are primary roads eventually that go to Emmitsburg. And we feel that's why Gardner used that route to get here, to go around those unit picket posts south of Gettysburg. 
One home he photographed in November of 1863 is this one, the G.J. White House, which is on one of the fords there on Marsh Creek, west of what is today Eisenhower National Historic Site. Gardner photographed this in November of 63, but he never published it. So it's really curious why he would photograph this particular house. Again, is this part of the story of his story of coming to Gettysburg to photograph those battle site scenes uh, in July 1863? I really think so. He never would have gone out of his way to photograph this house in November of 1863 if he didn't want to try to tell his story photographically. And we do know there's evidence that the son of Mr. White uh, led an army photographer to Gettysburg, at least guided him here to get him to the battlefield. Gardner's probable route, if not up the Emmitsburg Road, which because of the, the traffic, the Fifth Army Corps has jammed that road up, we do believe he came up across Marsh Creek down here at the White House, Red Rock Road to Millerstown Road, and eventually to the Peach Orchard and the Emmitsburg Road intersection. It's here that Gardner would have seen some pretty dramatic scenes right away. Um, there were burials everywhere. There were horse carcasses. The peach orchard was destroyed. One of the first things I think he saw was probably the uh, leftovers of the terrible fight on the Trussell Farm with the 9th Massachusetts Battery. It's highly possible, I believe, that those were some of the first photographs he exposed there on the battlefield of Gettysburg late on July 5th is the dead horse carcasses laying where they lay after the action on July 2nd at the Trussell Farm buildings. But what was the priority? Um, again, Gardner is not coming here, I don't think, just to photograph dead in the field. He's really coming here to photograph where John Reynolds fell. John Reynolds is one of the most famous generals in the Army of the Potomac, if not in the East. He's heralded everywhere. And here he is killed on July 1st on the battlefield of Gettysburg. Gardner, he reads about this as early as the morning of July 2nd, because the news just traveled like wildfire. And one thing he wanted to do was photograph where Reynolds fell if he could find that location. All he knew was that Reynolds fell very early in the battle on July 1st, somewhere around Gettysburg. And now he's got to come to town to find that spot. Where were federal bodies lying untouched in Barry's latest July 6th? We do know from the official records and some reports, um, I always call July 4th burying day. We have an excellent account from a officer of the 7th Michigan about burying Confederate dead on July 4th in front of the field of their position there, which was Pickett's charge. And it's also photographic evidence, as I said, showed out before, I'll go right through those real quick, of burials on the battlefield. These are some of the famous Gardner images taken by Timothy O'Sullivan in the slaughter pen. To the left up here are unburied Confederates lying where they fell behind these boulders and just about no more than 40 yards away to the left, as he was taking this panorama of Little Round Top, there are federal burials right there. What is unique about the battlefield, and what I did go over a little bit very, very, very briefly, was that it depended on who occupied an area. Um, there was a soldier, Edwin Gearhart of the 142nd Pennsylvania, who was wounded on July 1st. And on July 3rd or early on July 4th, he and other walking wounded were carried back over the battlefield. And what Gearhart remarked was that he was surprised to see so many Union dead still laying in all sorts of positions all over the battlefield, unburied, but there were no Confederate bodies laying around. That's because the Confederates occupied that area and they buried all their dead on the morning of July 2nd and early on July 3rd. It's very much the same in other parts of the battlefield. The Trussell Farm and House that I talked about earlier, I believe this is one of the first images taken here. It's a very hazy day. The weather was terrible late in the afternoon of the 5th. Uh, it would have been very hard to get a decent exposure, uh, especially on those plates that Gardner and the cameraman were using. But this is what's left of the 9th Massachusetts Battery. The battery horses there, they lost 80 out of 88 horses in the action here on the Trussell Farm. Just north of the Trussell Farm is this stereo view called All Over Now. It was taken by Gibson at Gettysburg. Gibson was one of the photographers. He shot a, used a stereo view camera of two lenses. And very close, uh, uh, looking at this photograph, you can see the conditions are very bad, very hazy in the background. But uh, Bobby Hoosh, who 
used to run the Gettysburg Daily, did a great expose and great study on this image. Um, got a very clear view from the Library of Congress. In the background, you can see supply wagons and artillery, I think that's an artillery forge from the Fifth Army Corps headed south down the Emmitsburg Road to Marsh Creek where they would be bivouacked that night. But also in this uh, image, what tells me a lot are these are fresh graves here on the battlefield of July 2nd. Uh, one of the theories that I thought of, and I have to admit I was wrong, um, was that those photographs of the federal dead were taken on the battlefield July 2nd. I changed that very rapidly after we went to the battlefield rehabilitation program beginning about 2001, 2002. Once we cleared uh, non-historic growth out, there was no way you could match those photographs there. I think that's what generated Scott and I and our interest in where those photographs were taken. Was it on the battlefield July 2nd? Probably not. There's evidence now that they're burials. All the Federals were buried and in the textual record, it says the uh, Federals were buried there on July 2nd. And they also buried a lot of the Confederate dead on July, or excuse me, not July 2nd. Uh, they buried them on July 4th. Question number four, once again, did Gardner purposely mislead readers with his caption of these images in his sketchbook? Uh, this is where the question comes up, why would he do that? Uh, Bill does cast a lot of doubt on Gardner's purposes in the uh, Harvest of Death images and description of it, uh, the, the field where Reynolds fell. He thought he added those basically to try to claim he was all over the battlefield. Why would we doubt what Gardner was writing? Uh, I'm not so sure we'd have to doubt that. Uh, and I will say, I'm, I'm not, I don't mean to um, disparage Bill's theories at all. We have better information today than what Bill had at the time he was writing those books. And I think one thing we have to study a lot more now is we have more accounts, more material in the official records than Bill had accessible to him. So it's not like he's wrong but there's nowhere to go with this in his theory. So he says it's probably might, more likely it was deliberate that Gardner made up a tall tale in his description of those images and where they were on the battlefield. So let's go back to the battlefield of July 1st. Um, Scott, I, I will say Scott and also John Cummings began to look at the battlefield of July 1st around 2010, 2011, and they began to publish their findings on the Gettysburg, uh, uh, National Military Park blog, and John also started to publish his images and his views on his Spotsylvania Civil War blog. Uh, the area we really think this probably happened was in the afternoon of July 1st on the McPherson farm just west of what they call Reynolds Woods, which is right here. It's also part of the John Herbst farm. The Herbst buildings are still, that, still there. Uh, the barn is a post-war barn. But it's in this general area, we believe, General Reynolds was killed in this site, in this general area here that Gardner probably came to on the afternoon or midday, early morning perhaps, of July 6th and found these burials unburied, these Union troops unburied. I compare these to the Elliott map and those burials on the Elliott map published in 1864. Uh, you'll see that there are burials marked on this field where Reynolds fell there at the point of Herbst Woods, right there on the eastern side of it. The seminary is over here to the right. You'll also see lines of burials out here in the field. Now we go back to plate 37, the field where Reynolds fell. This is the view as it was published in Gardner's sketchbook and it's been cropped very heavily. So you don't see a lot of the background. Uh, all you really can see are the bodies, which are the focus of the photographs, Destroyed fence in the background here, two trees, small shrub, and some other fields beyond that really can't really tell much of anything in these images. And I will say one thing that has misled people for years is this image right here, this object, which looks like some people have identified as a third core badge. Uh, in close view, at a high resolution view, that's actually a cartridge tin out of a cartridge box reflecting sunlight. So it's not a badge at all, it's just basically a piece of equipment. The uncropped view is this one, and I think this is more telling because again, you can see the background, the ridge of trees up here, cluster of buildings, 
two trees, a shrub here along this fence line that runs east to west. This was the view that Scott Hartwig proposed it to be in, taken in 2010 as published on the Gettysburg uh, Park blog. In that direction, it goes towards McPherson's Ridge, or which the, I'm sorry, excuse me, the northern part of Seminary Ridge to Oak Ridge, which is right back here. The uh, hotel there no longer exists. It was taken down about five years ago, restored by the Civil War, the uh, Battlefield Trust. Lee's headquarters is right over here to the right. Chambersburg Road runs here. Railroad cut just beyond that. You'll notice even with the modern tree growth that you cannot really tell the line of the Chambersburg Pike or the railroad cut. And then we can tell where the Chambersburg Pike is because of these cars on it. That is the view that John Cummings used in his Spotsylvania blog, very similar. I think a little bit more on the spot of the camera position that was taken. Uh, in this position, that destroyed fence runs east to west, right about here. Those two trees stood right about in this general area here, and to the right appears Lee's headquarters, northern extension of Seminary Ridge to the left beyond this. The structure in the background we believe to be the Thompson House. Uh, this is from John's blog. I think it's a very good dissemination of what you see in the very hazy image is the roof line of the building, the chimney, the fence around the house itself, and the trees in the small orchard that stood just on the south side of the Chambersburg Pike. Uh, traditionally, that is where Lee had his headquarters tent set up along with the headquarters staff, and Lee then used the house as a headquarters, which there was an excellent book by uh, Tim Smith, one of the licensed guides about Lee's headquarters and the Thompson House. Again, this is the, another view, the third view taken of this particular group, the final photo taken when the burial crew has arrived and are now starting to bury dead on the battlefield. They've already completed one burial in the background and the fence, the trees, and they're waiting for Gardner to finish his images. What is more telling about this particular scene is the exposure is much better. You can see more detail in the background. And by looking at it, you see again, the extension of Cinemary Ridge along here. This light covered area is probably the oat field that McPherson owns, part of the McPherson farm. The railroad cut, which is fairly new, you would not even see it. And then the Chambersburg Pike, which is marked by this lone tree way out there in the middle of the field. Again, we look at that fence and what John Cummings did on his blog, which impressed me and kind of falls in line with what this Gearhart said in 142nd Pennsylvania was that there were no Confederate dead laying on the field July 1st as he passed over. And what John was able to discern is this line of fence posts here in the background, which marked those graves, probably of Scales North Carolina Brigade, which also show up on the Elliott map. Uh, this is where Scales Brigade was literally destroyed on July 1st. Two weeks later, Matthew Brady will come and photograph basically the same area. Uh, he is not sure either exactly where Reynolds fell. Uh, he has a guide supposedly pointing in the general direction of the woods where John Reynolds fell. In this image from the McPherson Barnes to the east, you see Herbst Woods, Seminary Ridge in the background with the cupola. This large blob here are those two trees out there in that field. Thompson House over here to the left and the other structure here, which I don't remember exactly what it is. It was a house here at the time. It's the same home that uh, John Burns fell against. He laid on the uh, 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 cellar entry as he was wounded trying to make his way home. And in this 1878 view, this is what Scott put on the blog um, points out McPherson's Ridge, the direction of the images north and again south, the harvest of death Scott thought was in this general area here. He has since changed that theory further to the north on the other side of what's now this was no longer there, the horse railway out to the Catalyzing Springs Hotel. The view directly west from the cupola shows those two trees out there. Now the growth has taken over a little bit. They're much larger than they were in 1863, 
But this field right here is where those images were taken. Again, the view south, the harvest of death, plate 36. I think this is where we got interrupted the last time. I'm sorry, I'm kind of rushing through all this stuff. This is where we were the last time. Um, this is a view south on McPherson's Ridge towards Seminary Ridge, which you see off to the distance to the left. To the right is the wooded ridge just above the Emanuel Pitzer Farm. The Hagerstown Road runs basically just along this line here, marked by these dark figures, which are our trees. I know they've been interpreted before as buildings or structures. Uh, their shapes in a high resolution image shows that they are not structures, but they are indeed trees. And what was pointed out to me as I'm doing some research in this a couple of years ago, um, we know that the camera position was moved from the previous images, the field where Reynolds fell, to take this move, uh, this view south, which shows the result of a battle line. Uh, again, we go back to those trees, the view on McPherson's Ridge South. I believe this was taken by John Cummings for his Spotsylvania blog. Uh, the tree growth has changed there along the Hagerstown Pike and partially obscures Seminary Ridge over here to the left. But what is noticeable in those tree line right now are one of those trees that was photographed in 1863. I believe this is where I got interrupted the last time. So let's start here. Uh, the image on the upper left-hand side, that is from the Adams County Historical Society and is taken looking west on the Hagerstown Road called the Fairfield Road today. And you see some of those trees there, the tree growth that was there in 1863. I believe this photograph dates from about 1876 to 1880. And there are trees there that are identifiable in the view to the right of it, that seminary view, a panoramic view from the Lutheran Seminary, uh, tree number one, tree number two, a fellow named Scott Fink actually did all this designation with the tree numbers. Um, I will say that tree number one in this image up here to the left from the Historical Society, if I get my arrow on right there, that tree is still there today. Uh, sadly, it has died. It's just a dying hulk right now, but it is identifiable right there at that spot uh, as you go down the Fairfield Road. And tree number one is that one right there in this view, the harvest of death. This is another view from the Springs Hotel, the Catalysing Springs Hotel over the Harmon and Herbst Farms, taken about 1880 to 1884. And again, it shows Seminary Ridge over here to the left, the ridge above the Pitzer Farm over here to the right. The Herbst Farm is right here. The house remained, survived the battle. The barn was burned by Confederates on July 1st. The Fairfield Road, runs just the other side of those structures up here to the left, and several of those trees are up here in the background. You can see that show up in the back of that harvest of death image. So again, how these photographs illustrates events at this specific location. Um, I think the struggle has always been to identify where these particular scenes were. And, in my years at the park, I would say I probably had at least 10 to 11 people come to me with theories on where these photographs were taken. A lot of them were on the July 2nd battlefield, the July 3rd battlefield. Uh, none of them really seemed to pan out for a number of reasons because there's no solid landmark in any of these. Uh, I will say that Bill was very particular about locating his images for his work Journey in Time and also early photography in that he depended on physical structures, natural or man-made, to identify where all these most photographs were taken. Uh, boulders, rocks, trees, buildings, structures of some sort. The problem with these is there really is nothing to point out exactly where these photographs were taken except for projecting them with what we have found that Scott, John, and Scott Fink also put together. What do they illustrate? What this shows to me is comparable to those images that Gardner took along the Hagerstown Pike after the Battle of Antietam 
showing the dead of Stark's brigade. Those men fell there in the line of battle. Bodies were basically untouched by comrades or anybody else after the lines fell back. That's where they lay two days later and Gardner photographed them. And this is the same thing here. These men have not been moved and not been dragged into piles for burial or trench burials or anything else. They're laying exactly as they fell on July 1st. The only difference is that their personal belongings have been ravaged, scattered all over the field, their identities lost. Um, but we do know, looking at their uniforms and their equipment under high resolution images, that these are indeed federal troops, most likely of the First Army Corps. And then comparing the modern view today with the 1863 view, you can see the slight rise in the ridge. This is what I call Eastern McPherson's Ridge. Today is the line of Reynolds Avenue, the Abner Doubleday Monument here, just to the right out of the view would be McPherson's, or excuse me, Herbst Woods, McPherson Farm, and it's the same thing over here. What this does tell me though, it matches with the report of Major Alexander Biddle. Um, Scott brought this up in trying to discern who these troops were. I know there was a theory, this may have been part of the 24th Michigan, part of the Iron Brigade, because they were wearing the dress coats. Uh, that does not significantly identify them as being members of the Iron Brigade. And the reason for that is in the uh, winter of 1863, when orders were passed down to all the Corps for them to be wearing the Corps badges and other things, one of those regulations was that the dress coat was to be worn by all troops at all times unless on fatigue duty. So the four button blouse, the uh, fatigue blouse were very commonly seen on a lot of federal troops was not specifically being worn by members of the First Army Corps. They were indeed wearing dress coats that day. But Colonel Chapman Biddle's brigade was the last brigade in this general area here along McPherson's Ridge late that afternoon, contesting the Confederate advance, primarily men of, of uh, Pettigrew's North Carolina Brigade had fought so desperately there in Herbst Woods, driven the Iron Brigade and other troops back to this point Biddle's men were the last ones standing here, the 121st Pennsylvania and the 20th New York State Militia. If looking down this line, like I said before, to me, this looks like a battle line has been partially turned. And what Scott came up with in looking at the official records was this report by Major Alexander Biddle, who was there that day. And Biddle says, I saw the line of the enemy slowly approaching up the hill, extending far beyond our left flank which we had no defense. As the enemy's faces appeared over the crest of the hill, we fired effectively into them and soon after received a crushing fire from our right, under which our ranks were broken and became massed together as we endeavored to change front to the left to meet them. The immediate attack on our front was destroyed by our first fire. The regiment, broken and scattered, retreated to the wood around the hospital, the Lutheran Seminary building, and maintained a scattering fire there. If you look at that line of dead, it looks like the line has been turned back to the left, just as Biddle describes it. And the camera position turned again to the north, northeast, compared with this photograph that John Cummings posted on his Civil War blog. You see, again, this is the extreme right of that line of the 80th New York, or 20th New York State Militia, 80th New York Regiment, as well as the 121st Pennsylvania. And what Scott pointed out to me, which, uh, also kind of surprised me was that the number of dead on that field matched basically the number of killed in action as reported by both of those regiments, or very close to it, both of those regiments there, the 20th New York State Militia, 121st Pennsylvania. Uh, there are about 21 bodies, I believe, total in these images. And it's possible some of the dead in the distance may be Confederate, I doubt it. I, I really don't think so. I think they're all federal dead. and. Um, since there are no Confederate images or Confederate bodies anywhere, and we see the Confederate bodies buried in the background of Scales Brigade, it leads me to believe that this was these photographs were taken on July 6th, west of Gettysburg, in the general area where Gardner believed Reynolds was killed on July 1st. And that's how he carried it in his notebook, which unfortunately has never surfaced, and is carried kind of strangely in his catalog, but that is the true publication or the truth that he published 
in his 1866 sketchbook. So the conclusions are the primary site where federal dead remain and buried as late as July 6th was on the first day's battlefield. All the reports in the official records and others state basically that the last burials took place on July 6th in the first core area. In his catalog and subsequent sketchbook, Gardner, uh, Gardner was no historian. Let's put it this way. His, his knowledge of battle events and specifics of the battle was so limited, even three years later, no one has started to really sit down and write in depth about the Battle of Gettysburg and where certain events happened. All he knew was that his main objective of getting to the field was try to photograph the area where John Reynolds was killed, the most, like again, the most famous general fall in battle in 1863. He found that location thanks to the help of maybe a guide in town or somebody who knew the general location. Uh, that night of July 5th, he stayed at the Fonstock House, which also the Sanitary Commission headquarters in Gettysburg, and it's highly possible that talking to federal wounded there, many of them of the First Corps being hospitalized in Gettysburg as someone pointed him in the general direction, and that's how he found it. I really believe that he got out there to the battlefield July 1st, took those photographs and that's how they were carried over. And there's no reason to doubt it. There just is no reason. Uh, the terrain features in 1863, uh, altered sadly by natural sources and man-made sources are still there today. And if you take those photographs out and carefully align them from the general camera positions as John Cummings did on his blog and Scott did, you find the location. Uh, and I, I truly believe that that's, the, that's where those images were taken. Uh, the scenes themselves show the aftermath of a horrible, terrible close-in firefight. Those men who fell there, um, you know, they're object of curiosity to us today. Macabre curiosity in a way is that the same thing happened with the Rose Farm photographs. When Bill published his work, uh, that area in Rose Meadow, where those lines of Confederate dead were lined up, not buried, have uh, become kind of a, an odd pilgrimage site for a lot of people. Uh, I don't. I would hope that this doesn't turn to the same thing, because the one thing that always struck me is that uh, these men had names. They belonged to regiments. They had many different professions, and they fell here in the battlefield of Gettysburg for a particular cause. Their bodies were captured in images, which we still look at and marvel at today. We have to remember they had names, they had families. And the minute those photographs were being taken by Gardner and his team, we have to wonder, were those families in New York, Pennsylvania, wherever they're from, are they still worrying about their loved ones in the Army of the Potomac and if they'll come home alive? And this is photographic evidence. No, they will not. Horatio Warren, who was a... Uh, he was a captain at Gettysburg in the 142nd Pennsylvania. Um, the 142nd, which fought on July 1st, suffered a lot of casualties out there in the same general area. They sent out details to bury the dead on July 6th. That morning, the men worked throughout the day to find their own. They buried as many bodies as they could find. There was By this time, all identity was lost. And to be honest, the condition of the bodies was so bad, it was almost impossible to identify friend from foe. Obviously, these are friends because they're dressed in federal uniform. But Wright wrote um, soon after that we would devise all means in our power to render some assistance to our wounded and to bury our dead comrades with as much respect and love as is possible for us to show them under the existing circumstances. We ventured out to the first day's field where our regiment had fought. We went past Seminary Ridge, where we were first engaged in the morning. Uh, the afternoon of the first, and we find our dead lying where they fell, their upturned faces black from the burning rays of the scorching sun. So it was th with much difficulty we were enabled to distinguish one from another. And that's where they buried their dead. Scott once said, the only evidence that we know of, of what happened out there is really these images. And that tells us the intensity of the fighting out there on July 1st. I don't think there's any other site on the field as late as July 6th, when Gardner was able to take those photographs that there would be any other site except for the first day's battlefield. Um, 
all the things come together, all the evidence seems to fold together to this first day site. They're on the McPherson farm and the Hearst farm, just on the other side of the Seminary Ridge, uh, excuse me, west of Seminary Ridge between there and Herbst Woods. I believe this is the site, all the evidence that I have seen and I have read and I have studied as well as I have, especially John and Scott and others uh, concludes that is indeed the site of the harvest of death, the first day's battlefield. Just for our resources for everybody to double check, uh, Scott's entries on the park blog are available on the park, uh, park blog, Gaysburg National Military Park blog at wordpress.com. Uh, you put in, I think, three entries about the harvest of death images. John Cummings' wonderful blog, Spotsylvania Civil War blog spot. Uh, I also recommend people go back and take a look at Bill's work, uh, especially his journey in time, which again, set the, I think, set the foundation for all of us to study photography on the battlefield, as well as his follow-up book, um, uh, Early Photography at Gettysburg. And people need to check the official records of the War of the Rebellion again. Sometimes we tend to study the battlefield or study campaigns, read secondary sources, we don't check those primary sources which are available in the official records of the War of the Rebellion. If anybody has any questions, we'd be glad to join and answer them now and see what we can do. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you, John. Great job. Like I said, if anybody has a question, uh, they can either throw it on chat or just unmute yourself and ask the question. And don't everybody speak at once. <laughs> I have to kind of apologize. I know I'm racing through this. <laughs> There's a lot of information trying to cram into an hour without putting people to sleep. No, that's good. Okay, anybody Ricky, questions? You, Go ahead. Can you hear me, Ricky? Yes. Uh, just a question. Has there, are there any type of pictures? I'm sure there aren't, but just want to ask, at Iverson's Pits on Oak Ridge, that was a devastating place up there. It had to have been. Is there anything like that in existence? No, the, there are no photographs taken, 1863 photographs taken on uh, the, the Forney Farm, Oak Ridge area, yeah. or the 11th Corps line. Um, Gardner nor Brady went out to those areas. Uh, the only, the latest, actually the earliest images from those sites come up, uh, Mumford Views, I think the William Tipton, Tipton took photographs of that area, but it's not till long, long after the battle. Okay, just wondering because I, like I said, that must have been a, that must have been a, my, uh, my fiance's uh, great great was in the 88th Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. Yeah. So he was, they were right there when they charged in that area. And I'd, uh, I've been there several times and you could almost look out behind the second marker out there and see where they were at when, when they were attacked, when the, when the Union came over to, and went after them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just uh, if you go out there, if you're in the winter, you can't see it so much in the summer, but in the winter time, you can see there's an, almost an area that it looks like it's Shoot. ground down pretty good out there, even today. Yet. Yeah, the, um, the Iverson's Pits is the famous legend out there. Uh, the Forneys who owned that property refused to plow that area because of the trench graves that were there. Right. In, right. in 1872 73, when um, uh, the remains were removed. Forney still did not plow in that area. So those pits remained, those depressions in the ground for many, many years. I think some of them were partially obliterated when the Gaysburg Airport was put in in the 1910s, 1920s. Uh, and that was as long, long gone now. It's back into agriculture. But uh, yeah, there was always the legend of Iverson's pits that were out there. And there is very slight depression. You could walk right over it and not really see right. it. But that's where all the trenches, trench burials were took place. Um, but I had read it was like 1867 before some of the Confederate women came up and started uh, taking some of the soldiers away. Mm -hmm. at my recent pits. So what a mess. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, John. Sure. Okay, Don, you have something? Go ahead. Just unmute yeah. yourself. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. No, hey, John, always uh, an honor to have you speak to us with the wealth of knowledge you've uh, brought to us over the years. And 
Uh, really, I wanted to, you threw a piece out there on the Elliott maps, and I was just mm -hmm. curious on your take uh, with what just was recently found down there at Antietam. How do you, uh, what credence do you give the Elliott maps there at Gettysburg? Elliott's, <laughs> there are a lot of mistakes on that map, um, especially the Gettysburg map of areas that he marks as burials, because it, in the area of Pickett's Charge the second day, um, there are markings out there of the number of bodies, supposedly, and looking back at the official records and what we can see from photographs and other sources, um, the Fry Journal, which is at the park, list of Union burials in the battlefield, there, there's a lot of mistakes of where he thought bodies were buried. I think Elliot was in a rush to try to incorporate as many as he could onto this base map he was putting together. So especially in the field of Pickett's Charge, he says upwards of 300 and some Confederate bodies, I think. Uh, there weren't quite that many buried in that general location. So a lot of it sometimes was, um, I'd say, just a general guess on his part more than anything else. I, there, there's, a, there's a tinge of accuracy to it. I, I'm not doubting that. But um, when I was doing some work on the Rose Farm area, Coastal Farm and the line of the Second Corps on July 2nd, he has burials there that are marked as Union, which don't make any sense. Did not make any sense to me down the wheat field area. Hmm. So I, I do think there's mistakes made on that map that uh, that have just, you know, they're put on there. And, well, no one's really going to know the difference, but the best we can do in our survey. Now, I noticed there in front of where uh, supposedly, right, the uh, Reynolds felt looked like he had quite a bank of burials on the map you showed us. Uh, again, would you have that same assessment uh, of that area as well? I, I think, yeah, I think he's overdone it. Okay. I think he's overdone it. There are union burials there without a doubt. Um, the Fry Journal and some of the uh, other records we have show that there were a number of burials there along that ridge, but there were also burials within the woods, within Herbst Woods itself on the south side and in the woods itself. Um, William Way, who was the chaplain of the 24th Michigan, he was working one of the hospitals in Gettysburg and he heard that the dead of the regiment were still lying unburied out on the field. So he took some wounded soldiers with them and the Confederates allowed him to go out there. He buried as many of the 24th Michigan dead as he could find. And some of them were buried right there along the edge of Herbst Woods evidently and in the woods itself. Again, I think when Elliot was going over the field trying to make this base map, he's just basically estimating how many graves he sees. And in the case of some of these trench burials where there are no markers, there's nothing really to count except a line of soil. Uh, so he's just estimating. Right. But like, like you said, I think that area where he's marked heavily on July 1st, um, right at the edge of the woods, I think that's an exaggeration. Okay, thank you, John. Sure, thank you. Okay, anybody else has any other questions, comments? Again, John, fantastic job. Thank you for coming back. And thank you, just thank you, appreciate it. Yeah, just remind everybody, uh, next month, without Zoom bombing, we have uh, Scott Ming is gonna talk about the Civil War uh, murders of York County, which is October the 21st. We've had Scott before. It looks like a good, another interesting topic that we're gonna have. And hope to see you there, John. <laughs> I would like to. Scott, Scott's a great guy. He's done more research and study, I think, about the Civil War in Southern Pennsylvania, anybody I know. Uh, yeah. He's done a great job with this stuff. Yeah, and yep. he just finished another book there. Uh, I think him and Eric are working on to, to finalize. So, yes. Yeah. That'll be good. Okay. Nothing else. Again, John, again, great job. And we appreciate you coming back. And we didn't get bombed. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, thank you, Ricky. Again, I appreciate the roundtable uh, bearing with me. And uh, again, thanks again for the invite. Really appreciate oh, it. Oh, fantastic. We're looking forward to seeing you again, John. I, I'll get up there. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.